Good evening, everyone. I'm Skip Reimer, Executive Director of Events here at the Milken Institute. On behalf of all of us, welcome to the first forum of 2015, and Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, before we get started, just one quick scheduling note. Our next forum will be in two weeks, same time, same place. Uh, Tuesday, January 20th with John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope and advisor to Republican and Democratic presidents who will discuss his new book, How the Poor Can Save Capitalism, moderated by our own Paul Irving. Uh, you should all have gotten or will get an email on that shortly. If you haven't, you can just go onto our website and register if you would like to come. A couple quick programming notes. Today's book, Hall of Mirrors, The Great Depression, The Great Recession, and the Uses and Misuses of History, is available for sale right over here with our friends at Barnes & Noble. Thank you very much. You can do so anytime throughout the program until we turn out the lights. Uh, and as we normally do, we do take uh, questions electronically here now at the Institute. There's two ways to do it. One is by email, and one is by text. So at any time throughout the program, if you have a question, just please text or email. We'll, we'll show those to the, the gentleman behind me, and they'll read them to you after they're done with their discussion. So tonight we are delighted to have one of uh, our most renowned economists with us tonight, Barry Eichengreen. And uh, Barry is well known to us. He has appeared actually on this stage before. He has appeared at our global conference, and his work has appeared in our Milken Institute Review. Barry, always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming tonight. Now, Barry uh, will be formally introduced by our moderator, Michael Hiltzik. I will introduce Michael. Uh, Michael is one of those rare journalists who gets to have in front of his, when, it, when anybody introduces him, he has the, the words that all of us would, who were former journalists would love to have, which is winner of the Pulitzer Prize, journalism's the most prestigious award, which he was awarded in 1999. He, he has worked for the Los Angeles Times for three decades, uh, covering finance, politics, and technology, as well as reporting from Africa and Russia as a foreign correspondent. He's also a prolific author. And his next book, and I hope I can get this correct, Big Science, Ernest O. Lawrence, The Cyclotron and the Birth of the Military-Industrial Complex, <laughs> we're looking forward to that, will be published uh, later this year. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a delight to have with us. Please welcome Michael Hiltzik and Barry Eichengreen. <laughs> Well, thank you, Skip. Uh, thanks for that introduction. And it's my pleasure, in turn, to introduce our guest for this evening uh, and his new book. Barry Eichengreen is one of the anchors of the Distinguished Economics Department up at Berkeley, where he's George C. and Helen N. Pardee, Professor of Economics and Political Science. He's also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, during his distinguished career, he's held Guggenheim and Fulbright Fellowships uh, and worked as a senior policy advisor at the IMF. He's written or edited or participated uh, in one way or another by my count, uh, more than nine books, well more than nine books, I think, uh, that reflect his expertise in European and Asian economics in uh, the gold standard and the dollar and international economic policy. Um, that's uh, an extremely abridged list of his achievements and honors. This year, uh, he's on sabbatical at the University of Cambridge. So we're lucky to have him here with us tonight. And I hope you all uh, welcome him. Um, Professor Eichengreen's new book, uh, in fact, one of three books that he's associated with that will be published over the coming weeks, um, including two on the Korean and Chinese economies, is here, it's Hall of Mirrors, The Great Depression, The Great Recession, and the Uses and Misuses of History. And, and I'd just like to say a, a, a few quick words about Hall of Mirrors before we launch into our dialogue. Uh, anyone who has written or read about the 1920s and the 1930s has to be struck by the amazing parallels between the politics and economics of that era and our own over the last few years. The 20s featured a bubble market in equities and in housing, as we had in recent years. Uh, 
there was an increasingly imprudent approach to risk among financial institutions and precious little transparency in financial transactions. The US and overseas economies were linked in ways that I think were not fully understood by economists of the time or business executives or political leaders. The new presidents who came into office in 1933 and 2009 were both thought to be untested figures. Their intelligence and their wisdom was doubted. Their ethnic and national backgrounds were questioned. And even the political rhetoric employed against them had their similarities, despite the separation of eight decades between them. But among the many differences that existed between these two eras, one that stands out is the lessons that they took from the historical record. Put simply, Franklin Roosevelt and his brains trust didn't have an effective model with which to address the economic crisis of their time. Barack Obama did, and it was the model created in part by FDR during the Great Depression. And the use of that model, the lessons correct and incorrect, that the US in the 21st century drew from those events is the overarching theme of Professor Eichengreen's book. In writing it, by the way, uh, he's given us what I think is the clearest and most incisive chronicle of the events of the 20s and 30s and of the run-up and aftermath uh, to 2000 that I've read. It's an enjoyable, dramatic, and instructive read, and I commend it to all of you. So that being said, uh, let's start. And uh, Professor Eichengreen, you and I talked a little bit uh, bef before um, we, we met this afternoon about an event that's going on in, in real time that, that uh, maybe we should uh, take a special look at before we, we get into the, the, the gist of your book, and that is the Euro crisis. Um, Ambrose Evans Pritchard in the Daily Telegraph in Britain uh, wrote uh, recently that Europe's bond yield has fallen to the lowest level since the Black Death. Um, <laughs> my colleague Tom Petruno at the LA Times tweeted out when he saw that that that's the best bond-related headline ever. <laughs> um, but, it, but in your book, uh, you express what I'd call amazement that European leaders could have looked at the lessons of the gold standard uh, from uh, early in the 20th century not to mention the collapse of the European exchange rate mechanism in the early 1990s, and still create a monetary union that seemed to incorporate all the wrong features. Um, you write, for example, that the, the euro gave the European economies a mirage of stability, which is to say a false sense of stability. So, so why don't we start by getting your thoughts on how the euro interfered with recovery in, in the European zone, if you think it did, and, and what you think its future looks like. Well, not only interfered, but continues to interfere. So um, as you said, Michael, I think the parallels between um, the, the euro and its impact today on the one hand and the gold standard and its impact on Europe in the 1920s and 30s are, are, are direct. That in a deflationary environment after 1929, there was nothing that individual um, governments and central banks could do because they were constrained by the rules of the gold standard. They were tied together by the fixed exchange rates of the gold standard. Um, that terrible experience, which had not only um, painful economic but, but dreadful political consequences for Europe, should have been a cautionary tale. So, uh, and, and it's not as if they, they weren't warned. So many of us uh, in the economics profession were writing in, in the 1990s before the euro, before the decision to create the euro was taken. And then the, uh, it was created finally in 1999 that you, in the United States, we could have a single currency, the dollar. We could have a monetary union, in other words, because we also had a, a banking union, uh, a, single set of regulators for our banks, a fiscal union, a uh, federal tax and transfer system, and a political union. And the fact of the matter is that the European Union, circa 1999, 
could create the monetary union, but they couldn't create the banking union or the fiscal union or the will to um, conjure up a, a, a political union, and they're still trying. So the impact has been that individual countries have lost the ability to respond to their uh, economic woes. They no longer have uh, autonomous central banks with the powers the Fed exercised starting in, in 2008 to fend off deflation and, and try to right the mm -hmm. economic ship. They have very limited uh, uh, powers to use economic policy at the national level more generally. Uh, so that's the parallel. I think the, uh, the difference is that in the case of the gold standard, the mistake could be undone that if countries concluded that deflation and, and, and high unemployment were no longer tolerable and they needed to do something to get economic activity going again, which is what FDR concluded in May of 1933, they could abandon the gold standard, take control of policy and, and, and try to jumpstart economic growth. Individual European countries can't do that because backing out of a monetary union when you no longer have your own currency is much more difficult than abandoning uh, the gold standard and, and, and using beginning to use again your own national currency. Right, right. The, the fetters, uh, as, as you put it in your book about the gold standard, gold, gold and fetters are much tighter for the euro than they were. As you said, the gold standard uh, held these countries together only up until the point that they didn't want to be part of it anymore. Um, the European uh, countries left the gold standard during World War I because they, they needed to be out. And then, of course, FDR, although his, his budget director, Lewis Douglas, said this is the end of civilization, when FDR said, I'm leaving the gold standard, um, it, it could be done and it was the right thing to do to capture uh, at least the, the, the ability to manage uh, their way out of recovery. Um, and, and yeah, and, and b because of that, the, the way it's bound together, it, it makes the prospects of a country like Greece leaving the euro so much more shattering or at least so much more fearsome. Yeah, so I've been on, um, on record since 2007 saying monetary union is forever and that it, it, it's like um, Hotel California. You can check in, but you can't check out. It's, it's, like, it's like a Roach Motel. Pick your favorite uh, a, a analogy, and that's been right. That's been correct so far. Um, it may not be correct after the Greek election on uh, January 25th. We'll have to see, but I think what would happen if a country like Greece tried to back out uh, of the euro is highly uncertain just like what happened when we allowed Lehman Brothers to fail was uncertain and, uh, and I, uh, I, I think a serious misjudgment was made. Right. Well, you've started to, uh, to, uh, to connect the dots uh, with your last remark uh, between uh, the euro and, and the, the uh, theme of your book. And um, so your book delves deeply, as, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, into the similarities between the Depression era and the Great Recession. But you also, and I think this is one of the great values of, of Hall of Mirrors, you also do a lot of debunking of the received wisdom that we inherited from that earlier era. Um, so I'd ask, may, maybe we should start a discussion of the book proper. Uh, if you would give us a sense of the greatest misconceptions or maybe the greatest misuses of history uh, about the Depression and the 1930s recovery that you think may have interfered with, uh, interfered the most with effective recovery policy in the U.S.? In my view, there really are two um, levels at which you can try to answer that question. There are a whole set of inside baseball kind of answers. So, for example, um, an important lesson uh, of the Great Depression is that if you allow the money supply to collapse, and the banks to collapse and the price level to collapse, uh, you're at risk of seeing unemployment rise to 25%, which is what happened in the US in 1933. So the implication followed that if, we, if the Fed uh, expands the money supply or at least prevents it from collapsing, uh, addresses the problems of the banks, stabilizes the price level, all will be well. 
and we found out pretty quickly that that may be sufficient for preventing economic catastrophe, may, may, may be necessary for preventing economic catastrophe, but it's by no means sufficient. So this time around, most of the financial problems, many of the financial problems were outside the, the banking system in the so-called shadow banks. Mm -hmm. um, um, banks like Lehman Brothers that didn't take deposits from people like you and me, hedge funds, uh, derivatives markets, and so forth. And I, I, I think the lesson of the Great Depression, which was uh, stabilize the money supply, uh, address the problems uh, uh, of the banks, was certainly a misconception when it was applied to our, our own more recent experience. At a, at a deeper level, I think the, uh, the most serious misconception uh, which, which continues to uh, prevail. I think I if um, James Grant will, will forgive me, I would call it the James Grant misconception that he, he has a book uh, about the forgotten recession of 1920. Yes, you, you were just talking about this in, on Twitter and also I guess your colleague Brad DeLong cited your work uh, in a disquisition on Grant's book. So, so, so there, it, it's not only Grant's view, but it's a, it's a broader view that if government just gets out of the way, um, the economy will stabilize itself and, and, and begin to recover spontaneously. So I think there, there is a problem of, of interpretation if you look only at one recession, if you look only at one country. Um, we, we have to look at more than, than one experience if we're going to generalize. If you look more broadly at all the countries that were affected in the 1930s by the Great Depression, or at the experience of, uh, of different countries since um, 2008, 2009, I think it's pretty clear that spontaneous recovery doesn't happen, and that government has to step in to try to stabilize the economy and, and, and get growth going again. So we didn't do that perfectly starting in 2009, but I think to have stood back and, and, and let events, quote, run their course would have been infinitely worse. Now, it, you, you do talk in your book about um, some of the, the signposts, or at least um, the, uh, as I said, the received wisdom about the elements of the Great Depression that, that we still talk about. And one was the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which everybody talks about as one, one of the great errors, I guess, of American policymaking. And, and uh, you write in there about how the, the, the impact of the Smoot-Hawley tariff, tariff is, is uh, pretty much totally misunderstood by historians and economists, and, and we, we draw the wrong lessons from, from that. Can you talk about that a little bit? So the, uh, the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which was um, uh, voted by, by, by the Congress, um, Herbert Hoover having run for office in, in 1928, uh, on, on a platform where he, he promised to protect uh, American manufacturers is um, regretted, and I think rightly so, because it created international tensions, uh, putting up a tariff against the uh, exports of other countries in the midst of an economic crisis clearly won't make them happy, and, and, and it didn't, and it, it led to retaliation, it led to international recrimination. What it didn't do is make the Great Depression worse. The Great Depression was a deflationary crisis in the United States. Prices fell by a third between 1929 and 1933. Um, one thing the tariff did was push up prices, which is exactly what you want to do in a, in a deflationary uh, in, in environment. So um, if you ask me, um, what were the principal culprits uh, that caused the, uh, the Great Depression? Uh, I, I would put the, the Fed high on my list. I would put the gold standard high on my list. I would put some of the policies uh, of the Hoover administration on my list. I would put the Smoot-Hawley tariff very far down. Mm -hmm. Well, since you mentioned the Fed, let's, let's talk about the role of the Fed uh, both in, uh, in the 20s and again, uh, in the uh, in the audio arts, uh, uh, the recent audio arts is, for want of a better um, uh, term, um, uh, 
The Fed, of course, took a lot of heat from uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz in their monetary history of the U.S. for not doing enough to address the crisis of the 20s and 30s. Um, I, I gather you think that criticism is a bit unfair, but you, you do quote Ben Bernanke uh, telling Milton Friedman in 2002, um, Milton, you were right about the Fed, uh, and we apologize for what we did or did not do in the 20s, and we won't do it again. Um, and that raises the question as to, to the Fed's role uh, in the recent crisis. And, and I'd like you to talk about that and also look ahead toward whether the Fed is now better equipped to, to deal with the next financial crisis. Um, the fact that the Bernanke Fed was very forceful, but uh, did it do as much as it could have done? Uh, and if not, why not? Did it have enough tools or, or was the, the issues, as you said, of the shadow banking system simply outside its foxhole? I think where we um, should be critical of the Fed is in its actions before the crisis, where there, there's relatively little focus. So monetary policy was too loose for too long before the crisis, and that enabled a lot of the um, risk taking. Uh, it, it, fueled the, uh, the housing bubble. It contributed to the problems that occurred subsequently. The Fed is the most important financial regulator in the United States, and it fell down on the job prior to um, 2008. Um, I would give the uh, institution much uh, higher grades in, in responding to the crisis. Again, it missed the problems outside the banking system and the shadow banks. It it was one of the institutions that misjudged uh, how damaging uh, the repercussions from the failure of, uh, of Lehman Brothers would be. It was too sensitive to uh, the kvetching that occurred about uh, quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, quantitative easing did not uh, work too well because it wasn't tried too seriously. That, that's, Until, a, that's a chronic problem with both fiscal and monetary policy makers. Uh, they don't do enough and then they get blamed for what they do being insufficient or... or uh, yeah, so uh, I think the Fed is um, sensitive to, to threats to its independence and when it hears political uh, criticism, it uh, becomes reluctant to do more. Uh, I, I, I would ask, what is central bank independence for if you're not going to use it? Uh, finally, in 2011, um, with QE3, the Fed began to use it. Uh, it made an open-ended commitment, and I, I, I think the effects of that third round of quantitative easing are evident now in a, a, a stronger economy. Does the Fed now have the instruments to prevent the next financial crisis? Um, I don't think so. It's clear the Fed has the instruments to prevent the last financial crisis. <laughs> That's how economic and policy reform work. So the Fed has developed a, a set of new regulatory tools to try to crack down on uh, uh, um, certain excesses in the banking system. But um, one thing we know is that crises happen, and the other thing we know is that the next one will, will, will be different from the one through right. which we just right. lived. Well, I, I, I want to come back to that in a few minutes, um, that, that general theme. Um, but I'd like to spend some time talking uh, here about what history tells us about the right way to address a financial crisis of the sort that we experienced in the 30s and in 2008. And, and one of the issues I'd like to raise with you is this question of balancing recovery and reform. Um, these may, may or may not be compatible focal points for policy, but leading economists uh, and political leaders of both periods debated that issue. Um, Keynes, uh, as you point out in your book, criticized FDR uh, for, n for too much reform and not enough recovery. Uh, some of the brain trusters agreed, uh, although some, like Rexford Tugwell, wanted to see a lot more reform. In fact, uh, he was the one real radical, I think, in the, uh, in the brain's trust, uh, or at least thought himself to be. Um, one. And in the present day, we've, we've had economists like Paul Krugman, George Stiglitz, complaining that there isn't enough reform. Uh, 
though they would say that there isn't enough recovery either. So, so how do you balance these? Can you have both? Are they compatible? Um, do, you, do you need to have one before the other, or uh, do you really have to, to work on a parallel track? I'm a, a firm believer on the basis of both 1930s experience and, and more recent experience. You need recovery first. You need to prevent the economy from collapsing. You need to prevent more people from being unnecessarily thrown out of work. You need to stabilize the economy and get it growing again. And then you need to think deeply about the reform process. What does reform to prevent another financial crisis and deal with income inequality and the other Ill ills of, of the economy entail? These are processes that unfold it at, at different rates. Uh, and you have to address the immediate imperatives of crisis and, uh, and recovery first. Uh, that was what, uh, what Keynes told, told FDR. Uh, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, Michael, in, in December of 1933. But uh, I think there is also a paradox here that unavoidably, the more successful you are at advancing recovery, the harder the reform becomes. So um, the in, in, implicit question you're asking, and, and I, I suspect you'll ask it uh, uh, expressly <laughs> in a moment, is why didn't we do um, more reform? Why haven't we done deeper uh, financial reform? Why haven't we done more social reform? And it's because we uh, prevented another Great Depression. We put in place uh, economic policies, monetary policies, and fiscal policies that uh, uh, stopped the contraction of the economy in 2009 and initiated a recovery. It's been a disappointing recovery. It's been economic growth only half as fast as typical for, for a recovery from a recession. Uh, we are still, as a society, 10% poorer than we, we would have been uh, in the absence of, uh, of the Great Recession. But we at least avoided 1929, 1933 kinds, uh, that, that kind of catastrophe. And that relieved the pressure to do deeper reform. All right, and, and, and you point that out at several points in your book, and um, I, I just uh, one observation of my own, that when I was working on my book about the New Deal, I mean, one of the things that, that struck me, and I'm sure it struck you, and what really strikes anybody who studies uh, the Great Depression, is uh, the atmosphere of a really abject fear that gripped the country uh, in, in really uh, 1931, 1932, in particular, um, everybody from uh, you know the the, uh, the locomotive driver uh, on the railroads up to uh, the leading business uh, executives of the time, whether they were at U.S. Steel or anywhere else, and our political leaders, really were, didn't know how to get out of it. Uh, well, I under think the Hoover, particularly in the Hoover years, I, I appreciate that better now, even though I I'd written about that earlier period in in. Uh, an earlier book, I, I ap appreciate that visceral fear, fear better having lived through it. We all lived through it in um, uh, 2008. So I, I recall the weekend when it looked like Bear Stearns would go under in March of 2008. I was out weeding in the garden because that was the only thing I could do to maintain my sanity. I didn't know whether we were going to have a banking yeah. system when the markets opened on, on, uh, on, on the following Monday. So we have all lived through that uh, um, kind of experience mm -hmm. now, and I think that helps us understand better how the, the Great Depression, which was the same thing, but uh, even more dramatic, right. and uh, the shaped the, the outlook uh, of an entire generation of... But as you yeah. said, it, 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 the recession simply wasn't that bad, and and the 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 elements of um, uh, sort of the, the pushback starts. It started in the 30s and uh, in after 2008 pretty quickly. I mean, you you begin to get forces saying we've done too much. We now need to stop. We're on the way. Um, you know, how do you counter? How do you fight that impulse to? to say, you know, we, we've done it, 
we, we, the, the urgency has gone to reform the banking system or reform the financial system? Or well, I think the, um, the, the markets are, are, in a way, helping us address that problem. So um, we had a uh, somewhat disappointing financial reform act in, in 2010, the Dodd-Frank Act, which did not solve many of the uh, financial problems that had led, led to the crisis. It did not break up the big banks. It did not uh, limit them to making only safe assets. It did not ban trading in, in risky derivative instruments or force them to be traded on an exchange. It did not remove the role of the credit rating agencies from financial regulation, all things that the crisis suggested needed to be addressed. Instead, we got Dodd-Frank, which was kind of weak soup and, and took a couple of baby steps in the direction of addressing those problems. But then we got the, the LIBOR scandal, where it was revealed that the banks in London were rigging inter interest mm -hmm. rates. And we got the foreign exchange scandal, where we discovered the same thing about other banks. We found we had the money laundering scandal. We had uh, um, big banks evading U.S. sanctions on, on Iran and uh, mm -hmm. North Korea and, 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 and so forth. So I think um, the markets are, 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 are keeping this problem alive for us, convincing people that, that it wasn't simply a problem of a few bad apples in, uh, in, in the financial system, but, a, but, a, but a, a, a structural problem and a problem of, of culture. Mm -hmm. And now what we're seeing is that uh, the SEC and the Fed, as they issue the regulations that make Dodd-Frank operational, they're being more ambitious and more severe than, we ex than the banks expected them to be. So they are forcing the big banks to hold more capital than anticipated. They are keeping, f forcing issuers of securities to hold some on their own balance sheets and keep skin in the game. So I think there are ways to keep the momentum for reform going, and, and, and there is still some hope. Um, since you, you alluded sort of uh, uh, indirectly to the whole issue of securitization and how much institutions hold on their balance sheets, um, that sort of points us to, to the issue, the general issue of housing. Um, it's pretty clear that this has been a real weak spot in policy making in Washington and fiscal in, in, uh, in the White House and in Congress. Um, um, and you compare uh, the Obama initiatives, such as they are in housing, unfavorably with the main housing initiative of the New Deal, which was the Homeowners Loan Corporation or Hulk, which um, I think refinanced maybe a million mortgages and, and, and in a way did greater service to the American economy by regularizing uh, the mortgage, mortgage terms. Um, it created longer term mortgages uh, in the old days. The typical mortgage was, uh, was a balloon mortgage, very short term. Um, yet at the time, in the, in the 30s, there was a feeling that FDR wasn't getting his arms around the housing market. Keynes himself uh, questioned why FDR wasn't doing more on housing. Uh, so, so clearly, this is a—it's always been a tough nut to crack. And uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on why that is. Why is housing uh, uniquely such a difficult problem? If it is unique, um, and in simplest terms, the question that gets asked—you uh, know—at all levels of uh, the polity these days is: if we can bail out the banks, why are we having so much trouble? bailing out the borrowers? What's, you know, what are the ethical and moral and economic uh, points that we, we need to consider? So the Hulk or, or, or the Incredible Hulk did um, help one in 10 American homeowners with their, their mortgages over the, uh, the course of 20 years between its uh, creation and final uh, um, wind down in, I think it was 1951. Right, and, and so, I think it ended up uh, booking a profit, uh, or so it said. Oh, and, and, and that, as we know, with all government programs, depends on exactly how you do the accounting. <laughs> That's but, true. But, um, so why didn't we do something like that uh, this time? Number one, there, there are ethical dilemmas. If you help people who 
recklessly bought too much house and are now underwater, but you don't help the responsible borrowers. That's difficult ethically and, and, and politically. Um, if you help everyone, on the other hand, and, and in a crisis, there, there, there certainly is an argument for that. It becomes very expensive. It would have uh, involved much larger budget deficits than we actually saw. I think a case can be made for that, but that would have made a lot of people, including, I venture, a lot of people in this room uncomfortable to see a multi-trillion dollar stimulus as opposed to a $787 billion stimulus. Um, writing down mortgages would have created big problems for the banks. It would have created uh, big losses for, for uh, the, the banks, which uh, still held some of those mortgages, and for the other people who held the, uh, the mortgage-backed securities. So all this was different in the 1930s, when not only did people have relatively short-term mortgages, but the typical down payment was 50% of the home. So even when home prices went down, people were not underwater. What they needed in order to keep their home was a little bit of interest rate relief. Mm -hmm. They got it through the Hulk. They were able to keep their homes. It was possible to extend it to a lot of people. Um, I, you know, I think that the, we got ourselves into a problem through um, no doc, no down payment loans, and I think we still have a problem to the extent that um, uh, uh, we, we enable, we allow people to buy homes um, putting down only 5, 10, 15 percent. So if prices go down, which history tells us can happen, what we can, uh, we'll, we'll have limited options to address that. Well, well, that's a history that was very conveniently forgotten by, by lenders and borrowers. At the time, um, a man whose name we, we've now invoked uh, probably a half a dozen times, um, we should um, confront him head on. What about Keynes? Um, uh, despite the tendency toward austerity in the recovery period, particularly in Europe, um, how has Keynes and his precepts, how have they fared in the aftermath of 2008? I, I mean, one would think that given the superiority of the recovery and the less austere United States, Keynesianism would seem to be in pretty good shape or in pretty good odor. Um, your Berkeley colleague, Christina Romer, uh, has put forth the idea that the stimulative policies of the 1930s were too small, um, which was believed by the few Keynesians uh, in public service at the time, Lachlan Curry, for example, uh, one of the few uh, economists in the US government who had been trained by Keynes, I believe. Um, um, uh, and obviously, Christina Romer thought the same of the Obama stimulus. Yet, but yet the public debate goes on. You mentioned Jim Grant. Uh, we, we're seeing the uh, recession of 1920, 1921 being invoked even more as a reproach to Keynesianism. So uh, is Keynes riding high? I mean, ha has he proven? Uh, been proven to be right. So I, I, I remind you that I'm not only a Berkeley professor, but I'm visiting the University of Cambridge. Keynes's uh, um, alma mater and, 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 and longtime uh, employer this year. Um, we're ne never going to be able to answer these questions by looking only at the experience of the United States, where uh, everyone has their own strongly held views uh, uh, of government, uh, of particular government programs. What you really have to do is look across countries and over time um, and, and try to be a little bit scientific about the um, uh, 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 effects of um, deficit spending in, in, in a slump. Is there evidence of them? Keynes's arguments for it, for deficit spending in a slump, were controversial in the 1930s because what, wh who were the, the countries, uh, what were the governments that engaged in it? The answer is not the United States where bud federal budget deficits were small all through the 1930s, but Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy, uh, Takahashi's Japan. Uh, fiscal stimulus work to uh, get economic recovery uh, going in, 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 in those economies. Mm -hmm. Yet, uh, it, it, it's clear that because of the political context, 
Um, those views were controversial then, and, and, and the advice is um, still controversial today. But I think um, uh, the, the argument that when private spending is collapsing, uh, government has to step up with public spending to temporarily replace the private spending that, that, that was lost. That Keynesian precept is, is sound. People worry about the, the word temporarily. They obviously worry about the, the, the ratchet effect that if government spending in, increases, it's not going to be wound down again after the crisis. And, and, and I think the evidence for the United States is that uh, we are winding down. We did have the sequester, after all, the 8.5 percent uh, uh, reduction in non-defense, non-entitlement spending. We did allow the temporary tax cuts for the 1 percent to expire uh, as well. So I think the, uh, uh, the, the phrase temporary uh, uh, fiscal stimulus is, is, is not a contradiction. In fact, in American history uh, contradicts the idea that you can't unwind stimulus. I mean, after World War II, um, uh, we brought down the, the federal deficit pretty smartly, uh, you know, into the 50s and, and 60s. Uh, Roosevelt uh, withdrew stimulus to the extent he had any, um, but uh, very quickly and, and most likely prematurely 1937, 1938, and then had to reinstate it in 1938. And, so. and you know, the other thing I would add was that um, Keynes himself was a speculator, of course. He made and lost fortunes repeatedly himself and for King's College, his college in Cambridge, uh, uh, whose money he managed. Um, but, you know, he, he, he understood that, that markets are, are, are volatile, economies are fragile. Um, uh, it, it's not realistic to simply step back and, and, and assume the market left to its devices will, will be well behaved. And I think that Keynesian precept um, stands the test of time, and we had a reminder of that in 2008. Um, all right, I'd like to um, put to you uh, the famous question that Queen Elizabeth uh, asked uh, at the London School of Economics uh, in 2008, which you quote in your book, actually, you, you, you pretty much launch your book with this. Um, uh, she went to the LSE and she said, why didn't any of you see this coming? Um, and, and to be fair, there was no shortage of Cassandra's uh, warning about the stock market in 1929. You mentioned in your book Roger Babson saying that sooner or later a crash is coming and it may be terrific. Um, uh, even though on the other side you had people like Ir Irving Fisher saying that stocks had reached a permanently high plateau um, in 1929. Um, in recent years, there were certainly many who warned that the housing market was getting overheated and that mortgage underwriting was out of control. Uh, but you do point out that a lot of these uh, naysayers or Cassandras were outside of Wall Street. They were outside of the mainstream. Um, and, of course, Cassandra is famous for uh, knowing what was going to happen and not being believed. Um, so, um, so why didn't more influential people see uh, this crash coming? And, and how do we, have we learned anything about what the markers are that should be believed of, uh, of economies overheating or uh, standards uh, going to hell, so to speak? I want to be... Um cautious here, you know, my mea culpa is that I'm an a economic historian of the Great Depression. I spent my career looking at the earlier boom, crash, and crisis. And I wasn't out there warning in, in 2007 uh, that, that something sim we were on the verge of something similar. So um, at least uh, in, in this one context, uh, uh, I want, want to be sufficiently modest. Um, I, in, I, I, I think the, the question Queen Elizabeth asked is really a, a profound one. And I would point to two things that uh, led us astray before 2007, 2008. Number one, um, 
was the, uh, uh, the great moderation and the fact that the economy was seemingly so stable and behaving so well. Great moderation refers to the period from the early 1990s right up to the crisis when uh, it, it was claimed that uh, um, scientific central bankers and others had largely solved the problem of, of business cycles and financial instability. Uh, the business cycle was much less pronounced than it had been over the, uh, the previous quarter century. So when things are, when, when the seas are smooth and nothing bad is happening, nobody is looking for signs, uh, the signs that uh, there could be problems lurking beneath the surface. So we lulled ourselves in, in, into um, uh, forgetting what could happen. And the second thing I think is, is that economic historians, like yours truly, contributed to this uh, uh, neglect as well. We told a progressive narrative about the, uh, the Great Depression and what followed it, that terrible economic policy mistakes had led to the Depression, slavish adherence to the gold standard, failure to respond to the crisis and the bank failures with appropriate policies. Uh, absence of deposit insurance to prevent panicked households from running on banks. But we uh, learned those lessons uh, uh, of history and uh, uh, adopted federal deposit insurance without realizing that that did nothing to uh, uh, prevent runs by uh, big financial institutions that had lent to other big financial institutions. So I think in, in, in part, um, uh, the, the, the problem was that we convinced ourselves on the basis of that history that we had mastered uh, the crisis problem where, where that was far from the truth. And you, you, you don't want to mess with Mother Nature, I think is probably the lesson. Um, all right, we, we have just a couple of minutes before we're going to turn the floor over to, uh, to questions. Uh, so I want to, so, so my last question to you in this uh, first part of our um, uh, uh, of our meeting is, um, I, I don't know if you would agree with, with my interpretation, but I, I, I can't avoid the conclusion that the weight of your book is, is a bit on the pessimistic side. Um, uh, and I'm going to quote uh, at you its closing words, which are, the very success with which policymakers limited the damage from the worst financial crisis in 80 years means we are likely to see another such crisis in less than 80 years. Uh, and you, you talk at many points of the book about sort of the, the tyranny of forgetfulness and time. Um, so w w do you find hope that the next time will be different or that we, we have learned the lessons uh, from 2008 um, enough that, that maybe we, c we can recognize um, something like this happening the next well, time around? So I think, um, Michael, you're quoting that, uh, that final line answers the question that I Worry number one, that, that uh, we haven't done enough in terms of financial reform. We haven't put in place uh, protections, uh, adequate protections against the next financial crisis. And, and that this really reflects the, the, the paradox that the more successful we are at uh, recovery and at limiting the damage from the less, last crisis, the less pressure there is to do far-reaching form, uh, reform, and that's why we're still vulnerable to some of the old problems and, and to whatever new ones come down the pike. Okay, all right, well, um, uh, thanks. Um, and I'm, uh, we have uh, some questions uh, ready for you, so, um, which I can see and uh, you can see and our audience cannot. But uh, the, the, <laughs> the first question uh, harks back to what we talked about at the very outset, which is that given uh, what you've talked about as an obstacle, if not the cause, of Europe's anemic recovery, uh, and that includes monetary union without fiscal or uh, economic or political cohesion, what, what is there that can get Europe jump-started again? And how long do you think it's going to take for, for the Europeans to come to grips with their issues? So I think um, Europe is going to have to solve its problems within the context of the euro. Uh, again, as I said before, imagining that history runs in reverse uh, is uh, unrealistic, that it was a mistake to create 
the euro, but now the euro is attacked on uh, the ground and the Europeans have to live with it. Uh, I firmly believe that they have to address the, uh, the recovery problem first. They have to get economic growth going, which they can do with uh, uh, a combination of quantitative easing by the, uh, the European Central Bank and a commitment to doing infrastructure spending, um, something that they talk about but uh, haven't, haven't gotten serious about yet. And, and then they can do the structural reforms of labor markets and, and, and product markets that everybody in Europe talks about and that the continent also needs. So Europe is a good example of uh, a case where they tried to do the reform first without the recovery. And you might ask, how's that working for you? Uh, right, and that uh, sort of brings me back to, to one of the points that um, that struck me in, in reading your book. At, at one point, you uh, you talked about how every that policymakers in every country draw uh, the lessons that they want to from their own histories. Uh, and in Europe, uh, policy making, fiscal policy making, and monetary policy making seems to be really um, uh, imprisoned by the German experience in the Weimar period of hyperinflation and everything that the Deutsche Bank um, uh, did and now the European Central Bank is doing really seems to be aimed at addressing this period um, you know, 80 or 90 years ago um, that, that has had this lasting uh, effect on the German and, and us the European psyche. How do they extricate themselves from that? So I, I, I must find, uh, acknowledge that I find this uh, uh, a bit perplexing as well. Germany had a um, uh, devastating experience with high inflation in the 1920s, which has made them inflation averse ever since. But then they had a, a pathological and stream, perhaps. Yeah, but then they had a, 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 a devastating experience with high unemployment in the 1930s, which uh, I, I, I think the argument that 25% uh, unemployment in Ger Germany led to the Nazis is too simplistic, but the connection between uh, economic crisis and political extremism is there, and it's evident in Europe today as well. So uh, I can't answer your question entirely except to uh, say that policymakers and societies choose their historical analogies sometimes for their convenience. And in, in, in Germany, they have chosen to um, uh, base their outlook and, and uh, offer policy advice uh, on, on the basis of what happened in the early 1920s uncontrollable inflation and not what happened in, in, in the early 30s, which was economic collapse and, and, and widespread un unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, the questioner asks, uh, mentions that you've talked about letting Lehman go as a policy error and, and asks, why was this a mistake? Um, how otherwise do you handle the moral hazard issues of allowing private entities to profit on successful risk taking but using taxpayer funds to socialize losses. This is the old trope about uh, privatizing profits and socializing losses. And, and Lehman uh, is supposed to be a counterexample, I guess. Yeah, so I think Lehman, um, uh, letting Lehman fail was a mistake because it led US financial markets to seize up and uh, uh, pushed the entire banking and financial system to the brink of insolvency. Um, Citigroup and Bank of America and a whole host of institutions much larger than Lehman were pushed to the verge uh, uh, of bankruptcy. The uh, commercial paper market on which uh, reputable corporations like General uh, Electric regularly borrow um, uh, froze entirely, making it impossible for US companies to borrow, uh, uh, carry inventory, pay their workers, uh, pay their bills. So I think, um, uh, and, and only as a result of some uh, uh, very fast footwork were we able to avert the worst. So I, I think letting Lehman fail was a mistake. It, it should have been um, uh, seized by the government through one means uh, or another. Uh, Bernanke and Paulson, Henry Paulson, the uh, uh, Treasury Secretary in, in 
2008, both asserted that um, they lacked the power to uh, uh, I intervene and seize Lehman. I, I, I think they were trying to make a statement and trying to protect themselves ag against the criticism they were subject to for having rescued, for having bailed out Bear Stearns uh, six months earlier. I think uh, it would have been better to bail out or, 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 or seize and keep running as a publicly owned entity, Lehman Brothers, and then address the, uh, the moral hazard problem later through, through tighter regulation, recovery first, and, 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 you, and, and reform second. And do you think they could have or should have seen that letting Le Lehman fail would have, ha would have such devastating consequences for the entire system? Or Yeah, I th everybody uh, could see the, um, the, the Lehman problem coming. So Paulson's uh, phone logs indicate uh, weekly co phone co conversations with uh, uh, the CEO uh, uh, of Lehman from the point where the Bear Stearns thing happened in, uh, in March uh, of 2008. They should have sent um, more regulators and bank inspectors in to know what was hiding uh, in, in, in Lehman's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. They were surprised uh, in the end both with what was hiding there and with uh, how, how grave the problems, its failure, how, how serious uh, the problems its failure could, could create for its counterparties, for the other entities with which it did business. Mm -hmm. um, a questioner wants us to return, I think, to this question that we talked about, about um, the depression of 1920-21 or the recession then and um, and w w how to, to handle um, uh, the economic cycle and ask. Uh, some argue that depressions are self-correcting. Uh, certainly that was the received wisdom in the 1920s um, in, in the Hoover administration. Uh, but I ask, what would have been the consequences of governmental non-intervention uh, in, well, in the, in the latest crisis, let's say? Um, um, which I think is a question that has two parts. One is, you know, how do you protect the innocent victims of a downturn that severe? And also, um, you know, if, if the government takes a hands-off policy, can, they, can the system survive? So government non-intervention would have mean, meant that the uh, banks with problems would have been allowed to fail. And if people stopped spending uh, the the Corporations with uh, uh, em employees producing goods and services would ha have had to lay off their workers because nobody would have been buying. Uh, I think the, the, the question answers itself. Where would the demand, uh, the spending, the, uh, the profits, uh, the bank deposits have come from? Uh, they wouldn't have been there. So I, 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 as I said before, I don't think uh, when you have the kind of crisis we had in 2008, the economy is self-correcting. So um, back to 1920-21, that was not an economic crisis because it wasn't a depression. It was barely a recession. The US economy contracted by 2% between 1920 and 21, not by uh, um, 20% as it did in the Great Depression. So um, the, uh, the, the post-war downturn was uh, a, a blip, and it's easier for the economy to self-correct when it experiences a hiccup than when it experiences a depression. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go on to the next question um, here, um, unless there's uh, something. This is a question about inflation and deflation, if, if you want to take it on. The question is, if a little inflation is good, why isn't a little deflation good? And I guess the, the implicit in that question is, can you have just a little inflation and a little deflation in, in an economy like, like we have today? So we had a, uh, just a little bit of inflation for 20 years uh, before the financial crisis, in, in inflation that was running on, on the order of 2 to 3%. Um, that didn't explode in, 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 into a problem of, of high inflation. Uh, at, at any point in time after uh, Paul Volcker um, eliminated the uh, uh, 1970s inflation um, 
in 1981. Why is a little bit uh, uh, of deflation uh, a problem? Because if prices are, are going down, debts are getting heavier. People with those 30-year mortgages are going to find them harder to um, uh, pay off. If their wages are going down by 1% or 2% every year and, and, and their mortgage debt is not. Uh, people are not going to be spending if they expect the, uh, uh, the price of a car is going to be lower next year mm -hmm. than it is this year. Uh, the Fed is not going to have any room to cut interest rates if because uh, prices are falling, the interest rate is already close to zero. So uh, I think there are a variety of reasons why um, deflation can be a problem. It wasn't uh, a, a problem in the United States in, in the late 19th century when uh, uh, Frank Baum wrote the, uh, the Wizard of Oz about uh, uh, the deflation that was occurring between 1873 and 1893 because that was a good deflation. We were um, uh, industrializing in the United States in that period. We were pushing agricultural production and settlement westward across the plains toward California. We were producing more, more and more every year. Supply was growing faster than demand. So prices were falling gently. The kind of deflation mm -hmm. that Europe is suffering at the moment, and Europe is where the deflation problem is currently severe, is not because they're so productive or um, they're, they're increasing the output uh, of goods and services, but because there's no demand, nobody is spending, and, and that's a problem. Okay. The um, question here is um, really about, uh, I think, wage stagnation and, and maybe about income inequality, and the, the question is, how risky overall for the U.S. economy is um, uh, the trends we've seen in middle class, working class, wages and, um, and an income inequality, which certainly one of your colleagues at Berkeley has been out in the forefront of uh, writing and measuring and talking about. So I, um, it, it's clear that the U.S. economy is doing better overall now that we've had two straight quarters of near 5% growth. That won't continue, but I think growth going forward this year and next year will be stronger than it has been, uh, continue to be stronger than it has been in the recent past. It's clear that, that we as a nation and a society have a problem in that the benefits of that growth are not widely shared. They're not filtering down. They're not filtering down to the working class and, and the middle class feels like it's being left behind um, uh, as well. Um, Societies that, that function smoothly over a long period of time are able to do that on the basis of a social consensus. And if the benefits uh, of the economy and economic growth are not shared, you're not going to be able to maintain that consensus. What would I, 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 I do about this inequality problem? I would uh, acknowledge first that we developed it over a long period of time by uh, under-investing in education, vocational training, infrastructure, uh, and, and the like. And we're not going to be able to solve it uh, overnight. Um, I think we can uh, uh, address it in the short term by um, raising minimum wages because there is, in fact, very little actual evidence that, ha that doing so has much of a cost in terms of um, uh, uh, job creation. Number two, um, we can uh, address problems in the tax system that allow the very rich to pay no taxes at all. You know, the Warren Buffett secretary problem. And in the longer run, uh, the most important thing we can do is um, equip uh, Americans with the skills and training they need to be able to compete in a global economy because globalization is not going to go away. And how much evidence do you see, uh, if any, that um, that stagnation of uh, resources for the middle class contributed to some of the problems that led to 2008? Uh, I mean, the over-leveraging uh, of household, uh, the household fisc, of um, the, uh, the, the eagerness with which households uh, uh, 
exploited the equity in their homes, uh, leaving them with, um, with, with little equity. I mean, do, do you trace that to, to basically in, uh, income and wealth inequality? Or? No, I would um, trace it first and foremost to uh, um, reckless, poorly thought out financial deregulation, financial liberalization that allowed um, financial institutions to, to lend too much money to uh, consumers who are not always well, well informed. But it's the, the role of the financial regulator to anticipate those kind of problems. So I think the, uh, the crisis resulted first from uh, the way we did financial deregulation. It resulted secondly from the Fed pouring more fuel on the fire by um, uh, following an overly loose monetary policy uh, in the middle of, uh, of the last decade. And then there was maybe a small subsidiary role for uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and affordable housing goals and, and policies that in allowed or encouraged uh, poor households to uh, incur, incur more debt than they might have um, otherwise. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't put uh, inequality and, and those affordable housing policies uh, at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, a question that sort of deals, I guess, with econometrics in a way, and uh, you know, we'll try not to be too wonkish about it, but the question is um, whether the, the, the greater data and economic tools we had in 2008 impacted the response in 2008 compared to the Great Depression. I mean, any of us who researched uh, the, you know, the earlier period knows that some of the statistics were uh, are, are sketchy, they have to be reconstructed um, sort of by deduction. I think it was Francis Perkins who really instituted more rigorous uh, economic um, unemployment uh, statistics. Uh, unemployment uh, statistics. Um, uh, clearly we have uh, better ways to measure uh, micro and macroeconomics today. Did they help? So I'll give you a couple of answers to that. The first one is um, uh, the answer uh, uh, of Larry Summers, the Harvard professor who was in 2009 Obama's, uh, one of Obama's um, chief economic advisors, he said um, that he found nothing of value in the highly stylized theoretical models that academic economists had been developing of use for dealing with the problems that he was living through in 2009. And he found uh, historical evidence, so I am sounding my own horn a little bit here, much more useful for thinking about how crises can uh, play out. Secondly, in, in, in terms of the data, um, one of the reasons that we didn't respond better in, in 2008, 2009 to the crisis is we didn't yet know how severe it was. So, after it had in, unfolded in 2009, the Commerce Department revised the numbers and said, whoops, we missed how rapidly economic activity is contracting and firms are laying off workers. Uh, we might have done more. The Congress might have done more. The Obama administration might have done more. The Fed might have done more had the data been better in real time. And now there are a, a number of initiatives in, uh, in government to try to uh, improve real time economic data. Finally, I think we appreciate better uh, what you described, Michael, in terms of, uh, of the situation in, in the 1920s and 1930s. Contemporaries then were badly informed about exactly what was happening to the economy, and I think we end up being a bit less critical of how they reacted, having lived through that now ourselves. Okay, we have a question that sounds almost like it comes from the Rand Paul wing of the Republican Party. Um, <laughs> And it is that, uh, uh, it's that the Fed's balance sheet today is now over $4 trillion. Um, how do you think they should unwind that portfolio? If you think that that actually is an issue that's worth uh, policymakers confronting. I, I, I think they should un unwind that portfolio slowly. In, 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 in other words, uh, I'm uh, un uh, uncertain about when the Fed should, should raise interest rates because I don't know how close we are in the U.S. to full capacity now. Um, uh, 
millions of, uh, of workers between the ages of 25 and, and 55 have dropped at, back out of the labor force, and I don't know whether they're going to drop back in or not. If they do start looking for work again, there's lots of room to run for the economy, and I don't think the Fed should do any unwinding for the time being. When it comes time to shrink the Fed's balance sheet, it can do that by letting the maturing securities mature and not replace them. So a lot of the securities on the Fed's balance sheet mature in five years or in seven years or in 10 years. They will mature, they will run off the Fed's portfolio in the normal course of events. And the only question is, will the economy need more monetary support at that point in time? Maybe not, in which case the Fed can let bygones be bygones. Okay, um, I guess we have time for one last question, and it's a, it's a fairly uh, sizable one. Um, and that is, uh, uh, should too big to fail really be interpreted as too interconnected to fail? In other words, uh, I, I guess the questioner is really uh, saying that it's not size, but structure um, that is the real issue. Um, and points out that after all, because JP Morgan was big enough, it was able to absorb Bear Stearns. And, and I think what we've certainly seen in the last few years is that some of the biggest banks have continued to grow and maybe are reaching the size that um, caused a lot of concern before 2008 or up to 2008. Yeah, no, I think that's right. We're, uh, we should be concerned about the weak links in the chain because they can collapse the entire chain. The problem being that interconnectedness is hard to measure. and size is easier, so we address policy at what, what, what we can see, not at, not at what we can't. I think the regulators are, are trying to do better at, at managing, at measuring systemic importance uh, of financial institutions, which is what the, the questioner means, I think, by interconnectedness. But if you look at Europe, where the European Central Bank has been made the single supervisor for the important part of the European financial system. That means single supervisor for the 130 biggest European banks, not the 130 most important or systemically significant or interconnected European banks. So there still is this problem that um, we, we, we address the weaknesses we can see, uh, which are not always the weaknesses that matter. Okay, well, um, I think that uh, ends our session. We barely uh, really scratched the surface of uh, your great book, um, which, once again, I, I commend to all of you. Uh, it's, uh, there's so much more in it that we haven't addressed that, that I think you'll all find uh, instructive and fascinating. And thank you, Professor Eichengreen, for thank you. Time. And to you, Michael, as well. Thank you. And thank you all. Have a good night. sale over here. Strongly encourage you to get your copy tonight.